uh, today's edition, whether it's morning or afternoon for you, of our number three web seminar. Um, as usual, I do request uh, you keep yourself muted effectively at all times. If you have questions for Jordan, uh, please either virtually raise your hand or ask them in chat, and one of our, our, our maybe my co-hosts will will convey those questions to Jordan. Otherwise, you'll have lots of time for questions at the end. So without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jordan Allenberg, who's going to talk about what's up in arithmetic statistics. Jordan. What's up in arithmetic statistics? That's how it's supposed ah, to be. I get that right. Hi, everybody. Um, it's going to be a super casual talk. And as I said in the, uh, in the back, um, it's kind of my consolation for not like being in Jim Simon's castle in Germany to like chat about arithmetic statistics with many of the people whose results I'm going to mention here. So this is just going to be kind of like a lightly curated discussion of some recent results um, I found striking and I'll try to interleave it with some open questions. I know there's a lot of younger people who come to these uh, talks and uh, without further ado, let's start with a question that has motivated like, lots of interest in this subject, which is how many number fields are there? Okay, that's a bad question, right? Because there's infinitely many. So we have to refine this question a little bit. Well, first of all, let's pin down a degree. How many degree N extensions of Q are there? Okay. Too many, right? Not a great question. Um, for instance, even just even, well, not equals one, then it's okay. Uh, but for any n bigger than one, there's certainly infinitely many degree n extensions. That's an elementary exercise. And maybe just because it's good to have this in mind as an example to think about, um, e.g., uh, q adjoined root d uh, for any integer d, that gives you an infinite list of distinct quadratic fields. And in fact, it's kind of easy to see um, how many there are of any bounded discriminant. But a little bit of care because you might double count. So, but no, it's not counting number fields is not as simple as counting integers because Q adjoin root D is the same field as Q adjoin root D M squared. So you would have to find one representative of each square class of integers, which is typically done by letting D run over square free integers. Okay. Um, so to make an actual question, we have to cut down this infinite set uh, to something finite. And the most natural way to do that is to bound by the basic invariant of a number field, which is its discriminant, uh, which measures the primes of ramification. So now we have a question we can actually answer. Uh, how many number fields are there of some fixed degree over Q uh, and discriminant at most X? And by the way, we could, in fact, if we wanted to, um, even eliminate this because as it happens, you can show that if I fix the discriminant, that in fact bounds the degree. But it turns out that it's much more natural to sort of treat the degree and number field sort of as their own thing and fix the degree for all time and count that. Actually, that's for the first part of this talk. Um, and we're going to pivot about halfway through. Uh, and I'm going to take the other point of view where I fix the discriminant and let the degree of the field grow. But that's later. We'll just hold the thought. Um, OK, so now there's an actual question. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about what we know about it, because that's changed, actually, in very recent months. Um, so first of all, how do you even know this is finite? I sort of said, now it's a question. Now it's a question that has an answer. It's certainly not obvious that there's not infinitely many fields of discriminant at most x. Um, even for quadratic fields, you've got to do a little something. Um, but it's not hard to check that um, the, the discriminant of Q adjoin root D is, well, I don't know, it's like about D. And maybe there's some factors of two, which I'm not going to worry about. Everything we say is going to be so casual that we're certainly not, certainly not going to worry about constants. Maybe a more important thing to keep in mind is the point I made at the beginning that Q adjoin root D is the same field as Q adjoin root DM squared. So maybe better would be to say the square free part of D. Uh, and that's really what the discriminant is. But in any event, uh, certainly there's only finitely many integers. Uh, certainly there's, yeah, there's certainly there's only finitely many square free integers uh, less than X, and we could even get an asymptotic for that. So how many number fields are there of degree N with discriminant at most X? This, base, this is what we mean when we say counting number fields. Well, um, as I said, the finiteness here is an actual theorem that follows from work of Hermite. 
Um, and the standard uh, quantitative bound, um, I mean, this is essentially something that Hermit knew, but the sort of uh, the most general version of it is due to Schmidt. Um, so I say 1995, but this is really quite old, uh, is that you can get an upper bound of x to the n plus 2 over 4. So if you think about the quadratic case, the case n equals 2, um, you're essentially counting integers up to x. So that's x to the 1, and 2 plus 2 over 4 is 1. So that's good. OK, so it gives a sharp bound. But probably never again. Probably there are many fewer number fields than this. I'm going to explain to you how this classical bound works in a second, and you're going to see that it's incredibly wasteful. Um, and you know, I, I got into this uh, in my first paper with Akshay Venkatesh uh, about, gosh, now probably about 15 years ago, um, where after this bound had been essentially unchained for quite a long time, uh, oh, I lost the parentheses in my tab, sorry, uh, we were able to show a much improved upper bound uh, where that exponent of x, uh, the dependence on n was much, much better. Instead of being linear in n, that exponent is uh, e to the root log n. Um, and after that, again, uh, things sat in stasis for a long time and were not changed um, until just in the last year, uh, there was real improvement. And this came from first from a paper of Jean-Marc Cuvenia last year, um, which shows that you can get an upper bound of x to the log cubed n. And then just uh, two months ago, Robert Lemke Oliver and Frank Thorne uh, posted a paper on the archive, which gets that down to log squared n. So we're improving that exponent um, more and more. And by the way, maybe I didn't put a slide of this, but I think I'm going to say what's expected, but maybe it's a good time to say it actually right now, um, because it's a rather startling conjecture. Um, is that it should literally be x to the one, and you know, if, um, if you're used to this, there's lots of reasons why this is a natural prediction. But if you're not used to it, it's very weird because. You know, if I'm like, let me look at all of the degree 1,000 number fields, discriminant less than x, degree 1,000 number fields seem a lot more complicated than quadratic fields. So you might think there would be more of them. On the other hand, a degree 1,000 number field, you compute its discriminant maybe by some like the determined to some thousand by thousand matrix, which maybe you think is going to be quite large. Then maybe you think it should be hard for a high degree number field to have small discriminant. And somehow those two tendencies exactly balance each other out, or are supposed to, and you get literally the same exponent of n each time. With maybe, maybe I should say a different constant. My pencil disappeared. Um, and actually, this is a. Um, I should say that. I mean, there's so much of arithmetic statistics I'm not going to talk about, but I should at least say in my mouth, even though there's no slide, that for extensions with Gallo group. Sn, there's actually an explicit prediction for what this constant is uh, due to Bargava, and we know that it's true for n equals 3, 4, and 5. Um, for 6, it would require some monumental uh, conceptual advance that we don't understand. And people have thought about the case of degree 6 fields a lot, and we just have no clue. Um, Jordan. Let me talk a little bit about how this classical method works, how you bound number fields. And Sorry, what... Jordan, could I, could yeah. I ask a question? Or could I ask, invite uh, Thomas Bloom to ask his question? Sure. Thomas has, um, yeah, yeah, OK, great. Yes. Uh, yes, hello. Sorry, I wanted to ask, this um, C sub n factor, how, how bad is the dependence on n here? And is it roughly the same in all these different results? Or do these different results differ a lot in the CN behavior as well? It's it's going to be it's supposed to be um, a local it's supposed to be like a an Euler product. So it's not so it's not so bad. There's some I mean. Okay, let's see if I can get this on the fly. It should go down a bit because there's sort of some business coming from the Archimedean places that I think is going to give you sort of a somewhat negative dependence. And and in, in any event, it's not blowing up. But most of it most of its content is going to be. Um, some kind of Euler product. And so in particular, there's lots of stuff we expect um, in terms of, oh, what if I only look at those whose discriminant is prime to P? Okay, then the numbers should change by just uh, throwing out that factor in the Euler product, et cetera. 
Lots of expectations. Thanks to Bhargava's work and the low degree cases, we can prove everything. You go from five to six and you can prove nothing. Not even this, not even this exponent. So, so I'm just going to say like question mark, question mark, question mark, emphasizing that this is very far from being something we know when n is bigger than five. Okay. So having said that everything is and hard, let me say a little bit about how we can at least get upper bounds. Oh, and maybe I should say, okay, I didn't put this on a slide. So what, how do we even know, what do we lower? I think you can get, um, actually Kieran on the call, and I think he has a paper about this, but I think you can get X to the one half or maybe a, maybe actually there's even been a recent improvement about this. I didn't write it down. Um, so let's just say, I believe that certainly you get lower bounds that are of, a of the order of a power of X. And I think, you get about x to the one half or maybe one half plus something that's like some modest function of n or something like that. But you can't get that close to x to the one as far as I mean that we know how to do. Um, okay. Every slide I put up, I think of interesting talks I've seen by other people that I should have mentioned in this, uh, in this one. So, okay. So what's the strategy? How would you even start to approach uh, this problem? Well, of bounded, give us uh, a question. Sorry. Sure. Jaron Poonen, uh, please unmute and ask away. Oh, I was just wondering if, if is it possible that you get an upper bound of O of X even if you took the number, if you took the union over all degrees? Um, actually, I once wrote about this in an appendix to Lilopetsky. Um, I guess we wrote what would our method give for an upper bound in that case. Um, so in terms of what the truth should be, My instinct is yes. My instinct is that they decay pretty fast as n gets big, but I don't actually know if that's formally conjectured. And it's possible that's not true for some reason that's not in my mind right now. But my guess would be, yeah, even without the bound on degree, that you would probably get uh, an x to the one. But there wouldn't be like a nice constant. It would just be nasty. It would already be a sort of some sum of like different Euler products from different situations. Actually, that's true, by the way, Bjorn, that's true. Even if you, even if you, um, modules prediction for the constant just pertains to those uh, degree n extensions whose Galois group, whose Galois closure is full SN. So even if you mix the different Galois groups, you get kind of a huge, in terms of what the constant is. Okay, so what's the strategy for getting some kind of upper bound? Uh, and it, it, strategy of short integers and all the papers I mentioned use this strategy. So basically the idea is this. Um, I've got some field. I want to symmetrize number fields. I want to somehow find it. And as I said at the very beginning, um, one way to describe a number field is to describe an element of that field. And one way to describe an algebraic number, maybe the only way, uh, is to give its characteristic polynomial. And that's sort of what I did when I described quadratic fields as q adjoin root d, I was saying adjoin a root of x squared minus d, right? Just writing root d as my shorthand for that. Um, so let's try to formalize that approach. Uh, I have some field whose discriminant is bounded. Um, and I look at the trace zero integers of that field. Why trace zero? Because I don't care about like numbers like one and two. I just care about authentically interesting elements of this number field. So as a stratagem for doing that, I can require it to have trace zero. And that certainly rules out the copy of z's living in there. Um, this is a lattice in an n minus one dimensional whose co-volume is the square root of the discriminant. Uh, and then the glory of geometry of numbers in the theorem of Minkowski is that if I have, and I have some upper bound on its volume, which is exactly what I have for my bound of the discriminant, then I know that I can, that there's some lattice point that's in a small ball. I mean, any, comp, any sort of nice symmetric region, but in particular, I just want to sort of bound all the Archimedean valuations. And so, uh, oh, I sort of said here, you know, for all, this is for all embeddings of the field into R. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't see that. If somebody asks, do I need a constant multiplier? Yes, totally. And like every constant that depends only on N, I'm just utterly suppressing and pretending as one. Uh, in the interest of saying things fast. So yes, imagine a big, oh, I can use the highlighter tool. Imagine a floating C sub N floating over this entire slide and every slide, uh, as long as I'm in the N fixed part of this talk. Um, 
Okay, so I have this integer. All of its valuations are short. Um, so in particular, like we're trying to parameterize like q adjoin root 17 or something, maybe I would use root 17. I wouldn't use like 1,000 root 17 plus 5,000. I would use sort of in some sense the uh, representative. And polynomial is some polynomial whose constant, whose coefficients I can bound because the ith coefficient symmetric polynomial in these Archimedean valuations whose size as the real numbers I know. Um, and k is not totally real because, I mean, I, I should say, sorry, in Archimedean valuations. Thanks. Um, OK. Uh, so from there, now, now all I need to use is that once I, once I, that shows that every field of small discriminant is represented by some polynomial of whose coefficient is small, whose coefficient sit in some box. And now I just have to make sure uh, that this map is essentially injective, that um, I'm not, that once I have a polynomial, that actually determines the field, because then the upper, uh, then the number of polynomials is an upper bound for the number of fields. And this is why I don't want to, this is why I want to take care that my, um, that my short, in like, Five that it was an authentically something which generates uh, k, and then uh, and then where you get this x to the n plus two over four is just like literally if you count how many options there are for a two, a three, dot 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 through a n, uh, given these bounds on their on their side, the classical bound comes from. Okay, that that seems like a good method, but the question is how does this get improved? So, um, so more generally. Um, and this is in some sense gonna be a theme of various things I say today. Um, let's let G be a group. And this is gonna be the Gawa group of the number of fields we're studying. So we might, for instance, think of G as the symmetric group on N letters if we're thinking of generic degree N extensions. And let's choose some representation of G, um, which I'm gonna think of, you know, wearing my algebraic geometry hat as an affine space on which G acts, okay? Um, all right, so now I sort of, I mistech this. Let's write this in. What I mean to say is that pi is the map from v to the quotient v mod g, which I'm calling w. Okay, so it's this vector space modded out by the action of the group. And so this sort of classical example of this is this is sort of 19th century invariant theory, right? The classical example is when I find n space and the symmetric group acts on it in the usual way by permutation coordinates, the permutation representation, um, and when I mod affine space out by the symmetric group, I get an affine space again, but it's a different affine space. It's not the affine space I started with. Um, the affine space whose coordinates are sigma one through sigma n, the symmetric in the original coordinates. So if you like, I mean, I'm just sort of doing GIT here. W is gonna be an affine variety uh, whose coordinate ring is the G invariant functions on the original, on the original space. So this is kind of my, algebraic geometry rephrasing of the thing I said before, which is that we can, um, uh, well, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but that these symmetric functions are the coefficients of the polynomial uh, we saw the last time. And now here's the thing, there's a relationship between this kind of crazy quotient I made and the problem we're trying to solve. Because if I have a point here, some rational point on W, um, I can lift it and look at its preimage in the affine space. So again, if we think of the affine space as the space of uh, n-tuples of algebraic numbers and w as the space of polynomials, that's like saying, take a polynomial, look at its roots. Uh, I guess, actually, the way I set this up, maybe I should say the space of orderings of its roots. But in any event, um, the inverse image of this point is probably not going to be defined over q, right? is going to be defined over some uh, g extension of q, and that gives me to go from rational points on, so this gives me a way to go from rational point w to g extensions. And in some sense, the question before us is, I'd like to know that I can, uh, is every low discriminant 
extension, maybe I should say does appear from a low height point of W. Height is a little bit not the right word because I mean, this is really a situation where I'm studying integral points on affine varieties, not on protective varieties. So, I mean, one might literally say, we're going to talk about points of W of Z and ask about small coordinates. Okay, so the idea of getting upper bounds then splits into two parts. So this is the one I just kind of uh, scribbled on the last slide. The first part, for every field of discriminant X, some point of W whose coordinates are not too big, some power of X, um, which gives that field. That's exactly what we did a couple of slides ago when we said every, using Minkowski, we said every field of discriminant K has a short integer um, whose characteristic polynomial, the thing whose coordinates the symmetric functions, has coefficients that are not too big, bounded by powers of X. And we even wrote down explicitly what those powers were. Um, so that's part one. And then part two is you actually have to show that there are, give some upper bound for how many points there are, which in the case of counting polynomials was like really easy, right? If I want to know how many polynomials there are such that the, sec the first coefficient is this big, the second coefficient is this big, the third coefficient is this big, I'm just counting integers in a box. That's the kind of analytic number theory I know how to do. Uh, and I, by, multiple, by multiplying numbers and, and you're able to do that. Um, but of course, the reason I set it up in this level of generality is that the standard permutation representation is not the only representation of SN. So in some sense, the question is, can we do better by choosing different representations? Um, and, and this is sort of the idea that animates the paper I wrote a long time ago with Akshay. Um, and in some sense, it's also what's going on uh, in this new paper, paper of Robert and Frank, uh, Lemke, Lemke Oliver and, uh, and, and and Frank Thorne, um, instead of taking, if you thought I was going to have sort of some super fancy representation theory to take on this, no. Instead of taking the permutation representation, I'm just going to take our computation representation, direct sums together, and let SN act diagonally. Okay, so that is a different representation. Um, and in some sense, if I look at what are the points on V, that what this amounts to Instead of looking for a single short integer in K, I'm going to look for an R tuple of short integers. Um, it's not immediately obvious why that would help you. So let me say a little bit more. Um, for part two, now we have a different kind of variety. Like we have a n to the R mod s n. And this is not just affine space anymore. It's something more complicated. So part two immediately becomes harder. Part one is sort of pretty similar in terms of you just use Minkowski to show that you can uh, get a point whose Archimedean valuations are not too large. Um, so, all right, my tech got messed up. This is, should be alpha i to the ci. Um, so again, if you thought I was going to do something like really smart, don't worry, I'm going to do something really dumb. Um, I have some gigantic affine variety, which I know nothing about, and I want to count points on it, of bounded size. And the means of doing this is just going to be to think of functions on this variety and map the variety to affine space. So um, before, we used the symmetric functions as coordinates on w, and I took a short integer, and I said, OK, look at its uh, symmetric function. So maybe I'll write this down here. Um, when r equals 1, my functions of um, my functions of alpha are like, well, actually what I used was the symmetric functions. Um, I could also have used, and it amounts to the same thing, the power functions, right? The sum of the powers of the coordinates. So I could have used trace alpha. This one I actually chose to be zero. Trace of alpha squared, trace of alpha cubed up to trace of alpha n. Um, and if I know those, I know what alpha is. Um, So if I have more integers, so if I have a pair alpha beta, the function now I have a lot more functions I can use. I can use uh, trace alpha and trace beta. I might have set those both to be equal to zero, but I can also use trace of alpha squared, trace of alpha beta, 
base of beta squared. All of these are going to be integers, right? And all of them are things whose size I can bound if I've bounded all the Archimedean valuations of alpha and beta, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and so each of these functions I just wrote down is a function on this quotient space. Um, I just want to say I like how Bjorn has this static picture of Bjorn kind of making a nice smile as his Zoom thing, because then I just feel like, wow, Bjorn's really liking this. Like everything I say, I get a, I get a big happy smile from Bjorn on my screen. Um, the, uh, yeah, all these functions are bounded in size. And in fact, um, something really good happens, which is that, um, you know, what's the size of this thing? If the absolute value of, if every absolute value of alpha is less than some constant y, and these get pretty big, right? This is going to be less y to the n. Um, but here, I have a lot more functions of low degree. Right, because if I look at polynomials of degree up to uh, up to m in two variables, I have m squared then instead of m. So I actually have more low degree functions when r is large than I do when r is small. Um, so again, so I wrote a lot on this slide, but um, all I'm saying is if I if I have a point uh, on w, I can if I have capital M different functions, I can, that's the same thing as saying I have a map from capital W to affine space of dimension M. And then I can go from my G extension. Hopefully, if I'm Minkowski, I can show that that comes from an integral point of W whose coordinates are a lot too large. And then by applying these functions to a point on affine space whose coordinates are not too large. And then I can count in a box. I know how to do um, but we're not quite out of the woods yet because now, how do I know? I mean, this map could be horrible. I mean, if I chose capital M too small, for instance, this map is just going to down and then I'm going to lose the injectivity. And certainly if I want to derive an upper bound for the size of this set from an upper bound from the size of this set, I'm going to need some kind of injectivity. And in some sense, all the technical difficulty is here. Uh, you need to control uh, the positive dimensional fibers of this map uh, and make sure that you're not crushing down lots of number fields uh, onto a system of AM. So what that amounts to is you have to study the positive dimensional fibers of this map and um, be able to say that not only can I find uh, an R tuple of integers whose heights are pretty small, I can find one that doesn't lie on one of these bad Loci. So it's kind of a fun 19th century style thing to do. Maybe I'll just sort of say in passing when I were working on this long ago, our goal was actually this sort of, it was when Bombieri Pila and Heath Brown were coming and there was all these new exciting techniques and we were excited to use all this stuff to bound number fields. And we actually originally wrote the paper that way and then realized that in fact, um, sort of sadly, none of it was necessary and the techniques for doing this were completely classical in 19th century. So that's what we do. Oh no, this went off. Well, don't worry, I, I'm gonna tell you. Um, so we are able to do it, but we need kind of a lot of functions. We need about two to the two R times N functions. Um, but uh, Robert and Frank are able to do much better. I'm gonna sort of complete the sentence above it. Make it work with capital N on order of Rn. You know, the fewer functions you have, the harder it is to control the positive dimensional fibers, right? So having a lot of functions makes it easier, but it also makes your bounds worse because you're mapping to a bigger space and going to functions of higher degree. Um, and I just want to recall that, of course, remember, the dimension of W is Rn, because it's a quotient of A to the N to the R by a finite group. So it's be better than this. Like, you can't go any lower than the actual dimension of the space. So their result is in some sense like best possible uh, by this method and it gets you down to a much better dependence in N and exponent uh, than we were able to get. And to get past that, I think requires doing something truly different. So I promised some open questions. So let me sort of say uh, just a few thoughts about where one can go from here. One obvious question is what about other groups? So I mean, 
this is sort of set up to count degree n extensions. But of course, there's a huge interesting, which hopefully I'll get towards the end of this talk about counting number of fields with specified gala groups. Uh, so Evan Dummett has a nice paper from 2018 uh, in, um, about using methods sort of akin to those in my uh to count number of fields with specified gala group. Um, and I think it would be very interesting to now return to that problem in the light of these, frankly, much easier and less technical humans of, of Lemke, Oliver, and, and Thorne uh, to see if you can get improved upper bounds, um, you know, of the x to the sum function of, of g. I think it would be really interesting to know now what's best possible for this problem in terms of upper bounds. Um, and question two, of course, is I said, you know, the only thing running points on this affine variety w points in this incredibly mindless way of just trying to map it to some affine space and then counting points in the box. But of course, there's also a huge rich literature about counting points of, you know, rational points of bounded, integral points of bounded size uh, on varieties that really takes into account the actual geometry of the variety. And these varieties are very special. I mean, they're very natural things, quotients of affine spaces by finite groups. Um, so can one even conjecturally, even if you give yourself every possible conjecture of sort of Batirev Manin type, which is the sort of governing family heuristics for questions of this kind, what would follow uh, about uh, counting number of fields of bounded discriminants? So there is work um, by Yasuda about this from 2015, but I think this is an area where more could certainly be done. Um, and finally, I'll just say, as I said, the bound for this is supposed to be x to the one, but we're very far from knowing this, or even x to the one million. So we don't have any bound where the exponent doesn't depend on n. And I will just comment that in the field case, um, we do get something like this in um, by very different methods in the function field case. So this is a paper that I wrote with Pritang Tran and, and Craig Westerland. Um, uh, it's on the archive and which Everybody, including us, finds very hard to read and have, like complicated algebra and topology. So we're sort of in the process of sort of trying to boil this down uh, and write a more readable version of it. Just from the title, right? Can you tell it's like pretty different from what I usually work on? Um, but so I think something like this is function field case by methods that are in some sense in spirit uh, similar to the work I did with uh, Akshay and with Craig uh, on the cohen lenstra conjecture. Um, which maybe lends some credence if this is true, but I would say it still remains uh, very far out of reach. Okay, I'm going to make a total pivot. Gordon, uh, you pivot? Yeah. we have another question. Peter Sarnak, please unmute and uh, ask away. Hi, Peter. Hi. Uh, actually, maybe I misunderstood early on, but uh, if you count all number fields, up to a height of discriminant less than x without any restrictions whatsoever, not fixed degree. Is that conjectured to be a constant times x? Um, I don't uh, formally conjectured. I think it's probably true. And I would say it's, a, I mean, you may disagree. I would say it's a slightly less natural question. No, it's a question uh, that uh, when Faulting's proved his uh, Model conjecture in '83. I was an uh, instructor, assistant professor at NYU, and Harold Shapiro, who was a student of M. Lartin, actually said, "You know, this theorem that is proved, which the Shapirovich-Tate conjecture, is a generalization of the fact that there are only finitely many number fields of a given discriminant." So he said to me, "You do weird things." He says to me, "Why don't you count how many number fields have discriminant less than x?" And then he said, form a series, and does that have an analytic continuation? But I misunderstood the beginning. You seem to be discussing the case where you fix n. That's what I've been discussing, but I'm literally about to pivot and not do that. Uh, but you believe it's, it's believed that even unrestricted with n. I'm, I'm not sure people have formally, I, I would think so. That would be my guess, but I'm a little hesitant to, uh, uh, you know. I mean, even with that, the lower bounds that you gave are so poor. Say again? The upper, the upper bounds that we give, you can, I, 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 pay, I, I depend on n. Those depend on n, but those can be made to, you can get an upper bound without the dependence. 
Well, so what best upper bound do you have independent of n? Yeah, that, that, that's my exact question. So it's uh, upper bound of the number of number fields whose discriminant is less than x, period. Okay, that was my question. I, look in the <laughs> appendix, actually, and I wrote to this paper. That's where we wrote it up. I do not remember. Sorry, because I wasn't going to. That's like what was up. And you know, that's all. So I don't remember. Sorry. Um, okay, so uh, this was, this looks like the question I started with, but I'm changing. In the spirit of people who are asking about what happened when the degree changes, what if instead of fixing the degree and letting the discriminant grow, I fix the discriminant and let the degree grow? Well, I've written this is not a great question, sort of for the reasons that I said, that there is actually some bound on n in terms of x. So let me mess with this a little bit. Uh, instead of that, let's let let's say i'm going to number fields of discriminant x to the n of degree n but uh but it's fixed and n is growing and the reason i write it this way uh this is sort of a more natural uh first of all because this actually can happen with n growing and one way to get such extensions is that you fix some number field k of discriminant x and then take unramified extensions of that so now you might ask a different question. I fix some extent. Now, if I could start with k equals q, but q doesn't have any unramified extensions. If it did, I would ask that question. So I got it past some auxiliary number. Um, so if k is some number field of discriminant x, um, tell me about all of its unramified extensions. Um, but this is another, another way to sort of capture that is to say, what is the, I can just composite them all together and say, what is the maximified extension of that number field? Now, an interesting questions here, but uh, and one problem is that this, I'm not going to answer this question. For one thing, it depends quite keenly on the specific arithmetic of k. So having set up the question in this way and letting n grow and thinking about uh, all kinds of higher and higher degree, I actually do want to let x vary a little bit uh, and ask the following question. Okay, what if k is a randomly chosen, let's say, g extension of q? What does randomly mean? It means that I choose it from among the ones of discriminant of most x. So for instance, so eg, q adjoin root d with d uniformly random in 1 through x, maybe cho choosing a square free or something like that. Um, what can I say about the Galois group of the maximal unramified extension of k? And maybe if you haven't thought about this question before, I will emphasize that this is a crazy group. Might be trivial, like some fields like Q don't have any unramified extensions. Uh, it might be infinite. It might be an infinite probe group. And so this is kind of a, a very exotic kind of question. In some sense, I'm asking for a probability distribution on isomorphism classes of profinite groups. But even more than that, because I, um, my K carries an action of G, the Gallo group of a maximal unramified extension, carries an action of G too. So I'm looking for a probability distribu distribution on this very weird family of things. Um, and it's hard to even imagine how you would describe a distribution on isomorphism classes of profinite groups. Um, what's the precedent here, just to make it seem a little less weird, is that if instead of looking at all tensions, I only look at the abelian ones, now we're in a much more studied realm of number theory because the maximal unramified extension of K uh, is by class field theory, just the same uh, as its class group. And so now I'm saying, hey, in G extension, what does its class group look like? And that's the subject of uh, the Cohen and Lenstra and, oh, I meant I should put in and Martinet um, and by Winter Mala, my student Derek Garten, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a huge long literature starting in 1980 with this paper of Cohen Lenstra about uh, what does the class group of a random number field look like. And there, the great story is oh, I'm not going to tell this today. And I'm not going to tell about this, by the way. Sorry, I know that was in the abstract, but I ran out of space. Um, there is some developing sense in which we now understand what to mean by a random finite abelian group, be a random finite abelian p group, and that in Cohen Lenstra uh, conjecture is saying that the class random number field is an abelian group. And if that number field happens to have an action of G, then maybe it's 
uh, instead of being a random abelian group, it's a random abelian G action, which is to say a random item of this category. Anyway, the problem that we're talking about seems much harder. And sort of the development I want to point to is a very beautiful new paper uh, by Yuan Liu, Melanie Matchett Wood, and David Zurich Brown. It's on the archive last year, um, which is one of those papers that does write what it says in the front of the can, a predicted distribution for Gala groups of maximal and ramified extensions. Um, they produce a probability distribution on this set of isomorphism classes on such group. In other words, they give like a sort of good uh, motivated definition of what we should mean by a random profinite group. Um, and they conjecture that this is indeed uh, the limiting distribution for the problem that we talked about. And so basically, if that's true, that would allow you, that would allow you to answer any question about often a certain kind of extension of Q, totally from those discriminant up to X, um, how often it has an unramified extension with a certain Gawa group. So you can think of this as a non abelian cohen lenstrow conjecture, and it builds on like a large body of work leading up to this, a lot of it uh, involving uh, Nigel Boston, who's a colleague at Wisconsin. Um, Jordan? Yeah. Question, Joel Rosenberg, um, please uh, ask away. So uh, maybe his mic is not working. Uh, I'll, I'll just ask this question or read uh, his comment. So in between abelian and non-abelian would be solvable extensions. Would that make uh, the problem easier to handle? I mean, I think, so what's true is that a lot of the earlier work, so Nigel's work on this, I think largely can, can um, concerns pro P extensions, so the no potent case. So I would say the no potent case is a lot harder than abelian, but a lot easier than this. So that's what I would say is, I'm not sure solvable is that much easier, but no potent is definitely uh, technically easier. And that's some of the that Melanie and David and Yuan are, are building on here. Um, so, so one thing I'll, I'll say, I didn't, but one thing that they do that's quite um, cool is that they observe that there's certain kinds of groups that cannot occur, which I think had not really been noticed before. You have to sort of set them to zero in the probability distribution. Um, but that really creates a certain level of anxiety in a sense. Okay, these three folks noticed, which no one had noticed before, that certain kinds of groups are ruled out. Okay, so how do you know there's not some other clever person who next year thinks of some other class of groups that uh, that is ruled out and can't occur. Like, why should we have confidence uh, that this particular prediction is correct? And in some sense, I mean, I will warn you, for those of you who have not worked in this area, the original conjectures of Cohen, Leinster, and Martinet were like not quite correct. And they're basically based on things should be completely random unless I can think of a reason for them not to be. But sometimes there's a reason you didn't think of. And so there were modifications and Mala and Garten, the, the names I put on the last slide, were people who sort of slightly had to tweak those conjectures to make them more correct. So I will say that um, one thing I find really impressive about what you and Wood and Zurich Brown have done is they not only formalize these, this conjecture and say, these are the kinds of groups that can arise. And subject to that, we make some principal prediction on with what probability they'll arise. Um, they prove a kind of a geometric version of their conjecture. And it, you know, given the time, um, let me not say too much. What have I got on the next um, slide? Um, so of the following nature, um, and actually I wrote this and then actually they don't need this. So let me, I'm gonna cross this out because this is not actually I put this slide, but I, I have to repent of this. Um, so, i.e., um, if you ask about the limit as n goes to infinity, I'm going to write a very informal version of this of the limit as q goes to infinity of, and now I'm going to just commit a thousand sins against probability theory by writing something that's not really true. I'm really taking limits of moments of distributions, not limits of distributions, okay? 
Um, so distribution of um, unramified Galois groups of G extensions of FQ of T with discriminant less than Q to the N. Okay, so I'm replacing the number field with my favorite field, the function field FQ of T, which is supposed to give us a lot of clues to what's really happening over number fields. Um, and the really important thing I is that this gadget can be expressed in terms of algebraic geometry, in terms of the algebraic geometry of, um, of well, a, a, fine, a G extension of FQ parentheses geometrically is a G cover of P1 over FQ. Those are parameterized by a certain moduli space called the Hurwitz space. And you can express these questions in terms of the geometry of those spaces. Um, the real question at hand would be to ask about how this thing behaves in the limit as n goes to infinity for a fixed Q. That's mostly out of reach. But as every algebraic geometer in the room knows, you can do a lot if you let Q go to infinity. There's a lot of geometry that becomes simpler if you like let Q go to infinity and take limits by vague conjectures. Um, a lot of stuff drops out, and you're left with geometric questions that are much more handleable. So I guess what I'm saying is that um, this kind of reasoning, you should think of it as like it's like kind of like an error correcting code for number theorists. It's like it doesn't prove things about number fields, but if you have two competing hypotheses over number fields, typically one of them is going to pass this test and be consistent with, uh, with this kind of geometric reasoning, and one of them is not. And so what they show is that their conjecture, well, I'm sort of in the middle of a sentence here, I say, if you ask about, and the answer is, uh, yes, the predictions that their conjecture gives are in fact true in this large Q limit setting. Uh, so in particular, any group that they uh, actually does occur in this setting. Um, okay, so 1050. All right, let me just say a tiny bit about uh, the sort of Venn diagram intersection uh, of the two cases that I gave, and then we'll quit and take questions. Because um, I've said, okay, what if we, I started this, we fix a degree and look at fields of that degree of growing discriminant and try to count. Um, and then I said, what if I fix a discriminant and look at fields of growing degree with the same discriminant, like ramify to that same set of primes, what can we say? Now it's not a counting problem, but it's still like a, a problem what happens uh, as we change that variable. Okay, what if we fix both? What if we say, what can I look at number of fields of a fixed discriminant and a fixed degree? And I'll just comment that there's a, conje there's a conjecture. I don't think anybody really knows exactly whose conjecture this originally was, but it's kind of full. Um, which says uh, that if I look at the, fine, at the G extensions with discriminant X, you don't have too many that hit exactly the same discriminant, but there's an upper bound of um, on order X to the epsilon. So maybe I'll just say, um, so one way of thinking of this is that um, the first part of the talk, of asking if I average over all the discriminants up to x. So that's kind of like an L1 question, right? What's the average of the number of degree n extensions up to x? And this would be a question about like L infinity. Like what's for any x, what's the maximum number of number fields that can pile up and all have the same discriminant? Um, and you know, for quadratic fields, for instance, you don't have two different quadratic fields that have the same discriminant. But for larger degrees, that actually can happen, but one feels it should be quite rare. Um, evidence for this is pretty sparse, um, but it's what people believe. I think in the interest of time, let me just, um, I'm going to elide the connection with bounds on class groups. Um, well, I sort of have to at least mention it because those are the theorems I want to mention. A beautiful theorem of a long list of authors um, from 2017 uh, that give upper bounds um, for the two part of the class group of an arbitrary number field. And the point is that this can be thought of as saying, if I fix a number field and say it's too, class group, too big, it's saying I give some upper bound for how many, uh, 
for how many of some particular Gala group uh, can, can pile up on the same discriminant. And uh, uh, up last month by Jia, uh, Jia Wang, who's a postdoc at Duke, um, and a student of Melanie's, uh, gives similar non-trivial upper bounds for the L parts of class groups for any Novotin Gala extension with this sort of interesting set of exceptions. So um, people are working hard to get, in this case, getting upper bounds is um, even beating the trivial bound is quite hard. So, um, all right, let me, maybe I'll skip this. Um, I'll just circle this to be like this slide and I'm happy to talk about it after as about what you might guess for what that X to the epsilon might be in one case. Happy to go back to this if people want to talk about it. Uh, let me just close by saying something that was promised in the abstract. This is what I've mostly been giving seminars about lately, but I've decided I'm not allowed to give full seminars about it anymore until we release the blueprint, which I promised we're going to do soon because it's been floating for a while. So this is uh, work of myself and uh, the aforementioned David Zurich Brown and Matt Satriano. Um, so I'll just say that this whole set of problems can be conceived in a different way. The extension of Q, which we think theory can also be thought of as part of arithmetic geometry if we think of a G extension as a rational point, an entity called BG, which is the class of the finite group. Um, and so it's long been seen that somehow there's some kind of formal similarity between these problems of counting number fields about the discriminant on the one hand and the problem of counting rational points about the height on the other hand. Um, and in the work that's forthcoming, uh, we've been able to unify these questions by defining a notion of height rational point on a stack, a definition that didn't exist before. So this is a paper with like, the subject is really a definition term. It's like a definition in a lot of questions. Um, so just to have one short slide to sort of show you what uh, properties of some of this definition is, it does indeed capture the notion of discriminant of a number field. Um, it captures the sort of usual naive height of an elliptic curve. So we always call this the height of an elliptic curve, but this kind of ratifies that choice of notation by saying it really is what we would on uh, a stack of elliptic curves. Um, but let me just close with one very concrete example and a question. So a very nice stack, which I want to talk about here, is, and if you're ever going to talk about stacks, you're like, oh, I just take P1, but then I take three of the points and I kind of fold them in half. Okay. That's my picture of a stack. Um, and, and by the way, I just have to bring this up because Mike is here and Mike invited me to give this talk. Of course, Mike and I know each other because we worked on generalized Fermat equations. And in some sense, the modern way to think about equations like A to the P plus B to the Q equals C to the R is as certain kinds of integral points on this stack where instead of a half point, a half point, and a half point, I have a one over P point, a one over Q point, and a one over R point. So this was sort of a, a point of view introduced by, uh, by uh, Damon and, and Granville. So, um, so I'm gonna just close with one more question. Uh, the height of a point on this stack is given by the, which is represented by, the stack is by rational to P1, so it's rational points are the same as the points on P1, they're just pairs of co-prime integers. It's this quantity. I take the square free part of A, square free part of B, the square free part of A plus B times the max of AB, and I take the square root of all that. And then the question is very simple. If I'm gonna count points of bound height in our sense in that stack, I've gotta know how many pairs of integers there are, um, such that that's bounded. So this seems like a very tame question of analytic number theory, but I gotta admit, I don't know how to do it. So I'm gonna present it as a question. How many pairs of co-prime integers are there? Uh, satisfying this uh, inequality. And it's pretty easy. I mean, if you just let the integers be anything you want, you can easily get b to the 1 half just by um, letting little a and little b be at most capital B to the 1 fourth. Um, and our conjecture would predict uh, the actual answer is, of, is on order b to the 1 half plus epsilon. And some numerical evidence where, what does some numerical evidence means? It means that like when I talk about this in Harvard number theory seminar, by the end of the talk, Noam had already computed this like up to like something. And Noam told me that it looks like it's a uh, root B log squared B, which is a conformity. We don't know how to predict the power of log, by the way, for questions like this. So, um, so this kind of new conjecture that we make 
creates lots of questions about arithmetic statistics, of which this is sort of a sample one, which we don't know how to do. So hopefully we'll put that paper out soon and be able to ask lots more questions. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you for asking questions during and questions after. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you, Jordan. Everybody would like to give Jordan a round of applause.